Thank you all so much for coming today. You can go ahead and find a seat as we get started. Again, I'd like to say good morning and thank you all so much for coming on this day that we are going to reflect and remember and honor the life of my Uncle Peter. What an honorable man. And so today we're going to remember him and think about him, hear some stories, maybe laugh a little bit. And um, I would like to start by reading a scripture in John 11, verses 25 through 27. This is, in fact, Jesus um, attending a funeral service himself. And he's actually late to the funeral service. And so anytime I'm late to a meeting, I'm just like, I'm trying to be like Jesus, okay? So he's late, and they're kind of frustrated with the fact that he's late. And in John 11, 25 through 27, he's talking to Martha. And he says this, um, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Come on, I'm going to read that again. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Come on, that is the promise of Jesus. Those who believe in me. Although they die, they don't really die. They're just going to live forever. She said to him, or he asked her, do you believe this? She said, said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Again, I want to say thank you. So good to see friends of my uncle and family members and all in one space together as we think about my uncle Peter. And really what I want to just start off with is I'm reminded at the moment of his passing, I was reminded immediately of his faith in Jesus. It was his faith in Jesus. And Jesus promised, if you have faith in me, you will live forever. So although we miss Uncle Peter or whoever he was to you, a cousin, a, a loved one, a family member, although we miss him, we know where he is today. That's where we draw our confidence from because we have a rock-solid foundation upon Jesus Christ and his blood and what he's done for us, all it takes is confession and faith in him to save our souls and to place us into our home in heaven. Come on, that's the good news that we draw our confidence from today. I, one thing about my Uncle Peter before I pass it off to a song is if you knew him, you knew that his favorite thing to do, anytime I saw my Uncle Peter, now he lived in Virginia a uh, little far away from Massachusetts, but any time I ever saw my Uncle Peter, he was sitting around a dining room table around coffee or food, and he was having an extended conversation with someone. That's, that's what he did. He had conversations with those he loved. And I, in fact, the last time I saw him, I said, hey, Uncle Peter, are you ready, let's, are you ready for our three or four hour conversation? I'm ready to go. Let's, let's throw down right now. Let's do it. And so we would sit down at the table and just talk about Jesus, talk about faith, talk about life his kids, talk about whatever he wanted to do. In fact, he, he, but he always avoided the subject of politics. I don't know what it was. He always avoided that subject. <laughs> if you knew him or, or followed him on Facebook, you know that's a lie. But, but I, just, I, I just have that image as I just was thinking about this moment, had that image of my Uncle Peter around a table talking with loved ones about faith, politics, whatever, and just enjoyed that moment with his loved ones. Can I just say that is exactly what he's doing right now in this moment in his eternal being, in his eternal life. He's sitting around the table, no doubt with my grandmother and my grandfather and those who have gone before us, sitting at a table, maybe with Jesus, maybe with the apostles that he enjoyed reading, but he's sitting with them at a table having an extensive conversation that would probably take three years to have because now he has all the time. You know what I'm saying? And so that's, the, the, that's what I want to bring our remembrance to as we think about my Uncle Peter. Thank you so much for being here again. And let's be reminded of where he is. He is with Jesus, his Savior, and he's, he's enjoying his eternal life. Okay? So let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for what you have planned for the remainder of this service as we think about Peter. Uh, help us to acknowledge our Savior, Jesus. Help, help us to see you more clearly today. I pray that those who are far, those who are discouraged, those who are, feel defeated or far from you, God, I pray that they would be brought near to the heart of God today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God's presence is in this place. And let's just 
worship and cry out to him. Thank you, Jesus. Grand earth's quaked before Moved by the sound Shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken from my regard. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all. Are on you, and it is well with me. Far be it from me to not believe, even when my eyes can. And this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well, it is well. So let go, my soul, and trust in him. The waves and wind still know his name. So let go soul and trust in him the waves and wind still know his name so let go my soul and trust in him the waves and wind still know his name
I'd like to look back at, since this is a memorial service, I'd like to look back at some of my favorite memories with Peter. And when I was writing this and reflecting on a friendship, it seemed to break down into a three-act script, which I thought was very appropriate when speaking about Peter. Act one, the initial inciting incident. And for those of you who are screenwriters, you know what I'm talking about. Meeting Peter. I know I met him because we were friends for over 30 years, so I must have met him, or at least someone who looked a lot like him. I just can't remember exactly where I met him, whether it was on a film shoot, or at a coffee shop, or at church. But for my money, I think it was probably at a coffee shop because, as we all know, Peter liked coffee. Either way, we became really good friends because we had so much in common, and the biggest commonality we had is that we were fathers of young children. I've got many memories of kids' birthday parties and trips to Munden Point Park, trips to nurseries, trips to the Suffolk Train Museum, trips out to Fuddruckers, trips out to other sundry restaurants which I can't even remember because they're gone. And I know that we were probably insufferable gloating over our kids. We constantly share stories of all their exploits as they discovered life, the universe, and everything. And I can't count how many times Peter would call me up day or night to fill me on on the latest exploit of Andrew, Mallory, or the newly minted Christopher. I recall at many of these ubiquitous birthday parties, I would closely watch Peter and seeing that huge smile on his face as he watched his kids play. He was so in love and proud of them, and I can see that in my mind's eye even now. Beyond this bond of fatherhood, we were filmmakers. And we wanted to tell stories and, of course, change the world through those stories that we would tell. So we would spend many a night together with our friend and co-creator, Scott Popchez, coming up with a plot, a storyline, whatever, an idea, something we knew that'd be the next blockbuster. But the only problem was getting the money to get that blockbuster made and in theaters. Act two would be Peter in the Hollywood wilderness. Now, though Peter moved out to Hollywood to pursue his dream of writing and directing, we never lost touch and our friendship continued through phone calls. And as usual, our conversations were began with the kids, their trials and tribulations as they grew into adulthood and what, if anything, we could do to alleviate the crap storm that life throws at us all too often. Peter confessed to me many times that his biggest lament was not physically being there and he was constantly devising ways to remedy that. But unfortunately, Peter never had the Midas touch and he was constantly struggling to get that break that always stayed just out of reach. But had circumstances smile at him, I'm sure we'd be seeing many more of a film by Peter Eaton, and this tale would have been much different. You know, but life happens. When we ask God why me, sometimes God says, why not you? And I believe this is because God knew that despite the seeming Jobian trials that Peter faced throughout his life, his faith in God never varied. He was immovable in that aspect of his life. Questioning sometimes, yes, but always believing and trusting in God with a childlike faith. And that childlike part of Peter is probably why our conversation would inevitably lead to the latest tale of someone Peter just met. And I heard a lot of these tales because Peter met a lot of people, especially out in Los Angeles. And as any aspiring director, writer, producer, DP, etc., etc., makeup artist, what you name it, you got a network, and Peter had this knack of networking down in spades. And I attribute that to three things. One, he was likable. Two, he was a born storyteller. But more importantly, he loved listening to people sharing their lives and stories with them as he shared his story with them. And they responded to that. So though poor in finances, Peter was rich in friends. And at the end of your life, that's more important. Act three, Susanna. When Peter told me about Susanna and how God had nurtured their relationship and brought them together, I was really excited for him. And then I got to meet her before they moved back here when Peter entrusted her to us on a job visit she made to Virginia Beach. When I met her in person, I was a little concerned because Susanna was so introverted and shy. I thought that Peter would have to do all the talking throughout their married life. But fortunately, Peter managed to bring her out of her shell. Uh, but seriously, folks, I'm sure that everyone who knows Susanna can see that if ever there was a couple who complimented each other, and who enriched each other's lives, it was these two. And what was great for me was to be able to see Peter in the flesh again and to be able to hang out with him and Susanna. 
Now here and not 3,000 miles away, we immediately reconnected, pitching ideas, sharing challenges, sharing life, and provoking each other to become better at our craft, become better at being parents, become better at being husbands, and be better at being Christians. I said to Peter once, we should live each day like it's the last day of our lives, because one day we'll be proven right. To which Peter heartily amen and agreed. Sadly for us, that day has come for Peter. But I am happy that Peter was finally able to make it back to be near his children. I know that was dear to his heart because that was always a central theme in our conversations. That and his love for Susanna and most importantly his love for Yeshua, Jesus. I suspect that when I'm reunited with Peter up in heaven, he'll have a script already waiting, fully cast, locations scattered, the best equipment and crew, with millions of extras, but this time we'll have the budget. Abiento, my friend. friend Jason Savico, he, he really captured Peter and some of the things you may not know about him, his life in California and um, Virginia. So Susanna, we're so sorry for your loss. Thank you for marrying my brother because you got him. You got Peter. You understood Peter and you were, you're a wonderful wife. We're so grateful for you. So we're going to have a, a few eulogies and um, it's going to go like this. His friend from Ancient of times, you know, his old friend. When I say mean old, I mean old. No, that's a joke, Chris. Um, Chris uh, Chafe is going to come to share because literally I think they met in 1975 and have stayed buddies all these years. So uh, he's going to come up, and then my daughter Melissa, who just sang, is going to come up, and then Gail. And then last but not least, uh, my little brother Paul is going to come. So um, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to play a uh, tribute to um, my lifetime friend, Peter J. Eaton. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I, I really can't read my writing, so bear with me. <laughs> okay. We've got some lights up here, Zach, the house lights. I can think of them. His age, he needs them, you know yeah, what I mean? I'm an old timer. <laughs> Loosen the mood a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I got it. All right. Good? Yep. Peter, since the loss of you, I learned to live each day and take it as a blessing, knowing it may not always be this way. Since the loss of you, Peter, I've learned how to hold the tears when I want to cry. Uh, because all I have is memories. But one thing I know that you are in heaven celebrating. So well done, faithful servant. But mostly since the loss of you, Peter, I've learned life can be taken in a blink of an eye. Ecclesiastics 3.22 says, For everything is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. James 4, 14 says, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and vanishes. So Peter, in your case, is it no? I'm sorry. So in Peter's case, Lord said, "Well done, Peter. Welcome home, Peter, good and faithful servant. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted." The good news: God will never abandon us during our time of grief. He will wipe away the tears from their eyes, and death shall not be no more. Neither shall there be 
mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. So like Jesus says, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And I have to say, Peter was on the straight and narrow path and all the years I've known Peter, he never compromised God. He always had strong convictions for Jesus. He was a walking, living testimony for Christ Jesus. I know Peter would uh, say, heaven is truly beautiful. You just wait and see. So Peter would say, your life for Christ Laugh, rejoice, and enjoy life in Christ, and be free. Then I will know, with each breath you take, you'll be taking one for me. Sorry. So, Peter, I end with this. Thank you for your life, time, friendship. I love you, miss you, and you will... I will see you in heaven one day celebrating Jesus and continuing our lifetime friendship. That's it. I'm going to miss my Uncle Peter. <clears throat> this, I know a lot of us really enjoyed his posts, so I'm just going to read a few of them. <clears throat> I know a lot of us are going to miss them. I know he made me laugh. He had a way of um, sharing what he was passionate about, but also making people laugh. And there was this, uh, it seems like he just had this theme of grace in his life that he would share. This one from January 16th says, <clears throat> where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And then the next one is, the sufferings of this present world aren't worthy to be compared to the glories that will be revealed in us. And that just reminded me of what Chris shared a little bit. <clears throat> I can only imagine what he's experiencing right now. This one says, sometimes faith will make you look stupid until it starts to rain, said Noah. And there was a post that he wrote about um, Grampy, about his dad, and um, the end of it said, a couple years after he passed, I had a dream in which he appeared to me. He was a young man. <clears throat> he was as young and as vibrant and strong as in this picture of him wearing the cowboy, the cowboy hat back in early 1960s in Phoenix. He gave me a big hug so I know where he is and one day we will be reunited with those who've gone on before. It was a lot harder. <laughs> and then to share some of the funny ones. <clears throat> I like this one. On January 21st he shared um, they're like memes, so it's funnier when you see them, but I'm going to try to explain it to you. <laughs> a bank teller says, sir, your account is overdrawn. Me, so are your eyebrows. <laughs> well, that's my favorite one. <clears throat> the next one says, I overheard a lady saying she won't let her kid watch Peppa Pig because it encourages bad behavior like jumping in muddy puddles. I feel that one. I watched Roadrunner as a kid and haven't blown anyone up with dynamite yet. <laughs> I'm surprised British people call mac and cheese just mac and cheese and not like pity wickles and chonkers. 
and that's all. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gail. Um, I met Peter when I was about 14, and he was my friend. And we went to the same youth group in Pembroke, grew up in that uh, youth group there. It was a pretty large group, and he was the first one to go to Bible school out of that group, and we were all so proud of him. Then I married his brother, Neil, and Peter became my brother-in-law. But to me, he was more like my brother. I could be myself around him. I could say or do anything I wanted to do without feeling judged by him. He was an easygoing, laid-back person. He was very intelligent and could talk about any topic. When he'd come to visit, he would pack his French press coffee maker. He, like Caleb said, he loves his coffee, and he loves sitting back, talking. He was never in a hurry. But for me, my favorite pa part was when he visited, everyone got together. Family and friends and his brothers, Paul and Neil, would talk about old stories of growing up, and they would do impersonations of their relatives, <laughs> and everyone would laugh. What gives me peace is knowing where Peter is today with his heavenly father and his earthly father and mother also. Thank you for coming. Hey guys, I'm Uncle Peter's nephew, Ben. I just wrote some things about him. <clears throat> Uncle Peter was always a part of me and my brother's life since an early age. Even though he lived in various states throughout the world, um, he would always at least hang out with him and his kids um, once or twice a year. We used to call him Uncle PP, which I don't think he liked very much. <laughs> but he always seemed to love us very much. When his family came to visit from Virginia, they were some of the greatest childhood memories for me and my brothers. Uncle Peter was always a chill, very intelligent, humorous, loving man. So easy to talk about anything with, and you never felt judged. We always loved talking about movies. He was always very close to my dad, my uncle, and grandparents. And you can always tell he loved family more than anything in the world. I loved hearing about <laughs> my dad's childhood stories with him and Uncle Paul, and they were, and about all the ruckus they would cause in Weymouth. Kind of reminded me of me and my brothers, but maybe a bit worse. <laughs> Uncle Peter is the one who pushed my dad to follow Jesus and gave him a lot of the faith my dad has now, and I am forever grateful for that. His faith was always the first in his life, and you could tell by all the Facebook posts he made. Speaking of Facebook, the memes he posted would always give me a good laugh every morning, just like the ones Melissa read. Thank you, Uncle Peter, for standing up for what you believed in and using your skills as a director to create for Jesus' glory and being such a great uncle. We love you, Uncle Peter. going on, Seth, Neil's son. Um, just uh, real quick, I think uh, something that I, I, you know, as I thought about Uncle Peter, um, something that we could all learn from is, is to, uh, well, firstly, I, something was so special every time he visited, I'd always, always look forward to it. And you never knew if it was a, you, you never know when he's coming until like a week before, you and uh, him and Susanna, and uh, the day before sometimes. And um, and I remember, like, when my dad would say, oh, hey, Peter's visiting. It was some of the most special, most exciting times for me. I don't, I don't know what it was. Well, I, I, I will share why I think it was. But when I would find out you guys were visiting, especially when we were younger and as we grew, so I could appreciate his conversation, um, something was just so special. And I would get such an excitement. It was almost like, Uncle Peter's coming. I can't, I can't wait to, to sit down and talk with him. And something that, uh, that I, I think was the most special to me was, something that we can learn from was when he did visit, he just took time to be with us, to be with his family. And uh, 
I remember just sitting at the, on our leather chairs with the fire going. We'd have amazing conversation just about faith, about politics, about life, about his family. And uh, that's what I'm going to miss most. And I think all of us can and can uh, relate to that. It's just make sure you give your time, family. I mean, your your family time, and and make sure you just love those around you in the moment. Don't don't worry about your work. Don't worry about. I, just, I didn't expect. I didn't even know I was coming up here. My dad just looked at me. He's like, "Come up." I'm like, "All right, jeez." Uh, but just spend time with your family. You never never get caught up in the in the day to day things. Make sure you tell your family you love them and and spend time with them and. And that's, that's what I think, that's what I learned from it, at least. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. I've seen some faces here I haven't seen in a long time. It's amazing seeing you all. Thank you very much for coming today to celebrate with my brother brother, I mean my brother Peter, I can't believe he's gone, this does not seem real to me at all, um, but growing up with Peter was interesting because me and Neil had our own bedroom and Peter was across the hall from us and we never knew when Peter was going to sneak in the room <laughs> and scare the, the whatever right out of us, so, <laughs> and me and Neil would even talk, we'd be like, And all of a sudden would feel a hand reach both of our arms and be like, ah! So, and he would, uh, you know, always be interested in film stuff. Like, because me and the, uh, me personally, I'd be playing with my trucks and, you know, licking windows and stuff. So I, <laughs> and he'd be interested in saying, gee, I wonder how Godzilla, they made that, him capture the city or whatever the case is. And, you know, it made our lives more interesting because <laughs> I would have never had that if I didn't have my brother Peter. <laughs> but Neil's pretty cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this, it, just the things that guy did was amazing to me. And when he found the Lord, it was like he, he changed our whole family's lives. And that was the most important day because you could see a, a real transformation of my brother, Peter, because he was always interested in crazy things sometimes. He always thought way, way beyond anything I could ever think of. So to watch the transformation of my family and to watch his transformation. Because the most important message that my brother would want you all to know is that he is in heaven with God. That is the most important thing, is to have a relationship with your creator. Your creator has put you here not by mistake, and nobody in this room is here by mistake. And he has placed you here at this very moment to hear that there is hope no matter where you're at, no matter what's going on in your life. You have hope in a living God that loves you. His desire is to have a relationship with you, to rescue from you from this mess of a world that we're in right now. Because looking at this world, there's no hope, but seeing a God who loves you, who has promised you a new, new body, a heaven that lasts forever, and peace that lasts forever. That's something worthwhile. And his life was not a waste of time. My brother's life was all about presenting that 
And he wanted to do that with the film business more than anything. He wanted to reach the world with his, his visions of movies and things. And he did a pretty good job. I know in our family, you all heard everybody testify how how great of a guy he is, you know, how great of a husband he was, how great of a father he was to his children. I mean, we, sometimes I get bored to tears listening to how great his children was. It's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, so, but he's going to be missed, and I just want you all to know that he, everybody here, he loved you all, and I'm so happy that you're all here today. You have no idea what joy this brings to my heart to see everybody's face in this place today. Thank you so much. And I had more things I wanted to do, but <laughs> I'm just going to cut it right here. So thank you. I wasn't actually planning on saying something because it's been very <laughs> difficult to see. Okay, what can I share? And it hit me as I was sitting there that um, some of you may not know, Peter and I actually, we met at a film festival, perfect place to meet filmmakers, right? Being an actress and him, a director. And uh, this was in uh, January of... 2010 and we were just friends you know for a couple of years uh, and uh, then later on it changed for him first that uh, he wanted to be more than friends and I have to tell you that the, the, the something funny is that it was on Easter of uh, 2012 and I uh, went over to his apartment he was living with a friend there and uh, we were cooking dinner together he loved Italian food and uh, it's so, after that, we had a great time, uh, conversation. And so when I got in the car to leave, to go home, and he calls me on my phone, and he says, I think I'm falling in love with you. And I said, that's the wine talking. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so we continue to be friends, and then he again said that uh, he wanted to be more than friends. He, I, I, he said, um, one time he just blurted out, I, I think I want to date you. And I, and I said, well, what does that look like to you? Um, kissing and holding hands? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I, uh, but me, I really wanted to make sure that this is what God wanted for, for, for me and for both of us. So I prayed a lot about it. And after a couple of months, um, the Lord just said, had told me, yeah, this is the man you're supposed to marry. I waited a long time for him. <laughs> and uh, and my friends, though, they saw it first because they actually said when they commented, when Peter actually stood two hours in line with me um, on Sunset Boulevard waiting to get this free um, coffee maker. He loved coffee bean. <laughs> he loved coffee bean tea and leaf. And so it was a special promotion. And so I would, um, all I had to do was take my current coffee maker that was working and then just trade it in. So he stood there for two hours with me and my friends would say, okay, that guy, he is so right for you. <laughs> so it's like, so anyway, um, I knew that um, Peter was the one for me because of uh, how my family loved him. And then, and I fell in love with his family. And, uh, and his mom, I never got to meet his dad, but I loved Rachel. Uh, so it was like, wow, I knew when we met each other's families, I said, yeah, this is good, especially with my brother. And I actually said that he liked him. So <laughs> that was good. <laughs> so through uh, our years 
um, you know, our, our, how we got married was just a beautiful wedding, and you know, officiated the wedding, and just our lives together for, for uh, almost married for almost eight years, would be May third, but. The, through the ups and downs and through our dreams and our goals and just wanting to make a difference in people's lives with through film. And I'm just so blessed that we got to work together on, um, on a few of those. So it was really a shock because uh, the day when Peter passed that morning, the 23rd of January, and... <laughs> I actually had online church on, you know, on, they, were, they weren't meeting, um, they snowed, so they weren't meeting in person, and, um, you know, that morning, when I had, was, had the worship on, and then hearing Peter, when this happened, and it was, it was just, I can't believe this is happening, and it happened so fast, but as I look back on that time, and just in visualizing just how Peter was, I guess, a filmmaker, it was like his soul was immediately, you know, it's like being vacuumed up into this beautiful light. And even though it was for a moment, not sure, you know, just just pulling back, pulling up, and then being in the presence of God, well, in his glory. And um, this verse uh, came to me uh, a few days ago, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So Peter now knows completely. I love you, Peter. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment when I wake up to lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. You have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God You have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down i surrender now i give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me yeah your goodness is running after it's running after to me, oh, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, with 
my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness I just need to take this in. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Joy. So many people that we know and love for so many years. Doug, thank you. Got some more Eaton representation back there. If you want to know where the Eatons are, just look for this spot right here. <laughs> Paul's is there. He just hides it better. Right, Doug? I love you all so much, like Paul said. Paul, you did such a great job. I think you should start preaching, by the way. How many of you think? All, all, of, the, all of the Eatons, come on. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Come on, Tom. You should have heard my nephew, Tom, in uh, Virginia. You're amazing. You, the whole, you take up almost this whole row. Chris, so good, man. So good. Love your words. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about Peter, and then I just want to give a gospel word briefly. Don't look at me like that. I was thinking, Paul, it's, uh, we started with a family of five, mom, dad, and they used to call us my three sons, Peter, Paul, and not Mary, Peter, Paul, and Neil. If anybody says that, I'll tell you what. I heard it all my life. So there's Peter and there's Paul. What are you, Mary? Shut up. <laughs> Good to see you, Evan and Bill Bates. Oh, my gosh, all our Weymouth people. Wow. We could tell stories. We're not going to, though. Um, so I knew I cared about you, Peter, when Dad had you on his shoulders when he took you on a hike over the rocks at Nantasket Beach, and then he slipped, and then you smashed your head on a rock, and that scared me, it scared all of us, because I saw my brother coming back from a walk on the rocks with blood coming down his head, but, but you were okay, Peter. And then when we were a little older, and we went on an adventurous bike ride, big day out on our bikes, we went all the way to Paragon Park from Weymouth one day, but on your way home, you were leading the way on your bike coming down that hill uh, toward the rotary in Hingham. Once again, you smashed your head. This time you got an amnesia. Peter couldn't remember what in the world was going on, and I was afraid that um, he messed his, his head up. Um, but you were okay. Come to think of it, Peter, you hit your head a lot. <laughs> but it had the reverse effect because he ended up smarter than all of us. I used to call him the walking information bomb because you never knew when Peter's information bomb was going to blow off, whether you wanted him to or not. You were going to know a lot more after you left than when you were with him. But I, I really knew I cared about Peter when one day we were in our kitchen at 696 Commercial Street in Weymouth, and there was a stairway in the kitchen leading up to Paul's bedroom. And right there in front of that stairway, Peter swallowed something and he couldn't breathe and it was incredibly scary our whole family was panicking we were crying we were praying and um he accidentally swallowed something and all of a sudden shazam he could breathe we found out later on it was ice and it finally melted but oh, i guess peter had a lot of hot air so he was able to melt that ice and peter you were okay so i did care about you but i'm also very sorry peter when uh, you got your car and your license before me. I was dating Gail. You didn't know this secret going out right now. 
Peter liked Gail before I did. Well, I liked Gail first, and then he liked her because Gail wouldn't have anything to do with me because I was a rebel and Peter was a straight laced, and I went through my little rebellion years. So he thought that God told her that he's supposed to marry, uh, that they were supposed to marry. So he took her in a room. He said, God told me that we're supposed to marry. Gail's thinking, doesn't he? Is he supposed to tell me that too? Uh, so anyways, Peter then, this, this was not in the script, it's, but it's getting out there. Let's just let it out. Sorry, Peter. Um, so anyways, she just wasn't, didn't feel like it was God's will. Uh, great guy, but, you know, she had somebody else in mind, right? So um, anyways, when I got my life straightened out, because Gail always walked with Jesus, she always walked the line, he was getting tired of her not take, you know, checking up on his advances. So he said, I'll tell you what, I got a deal. He said, I, I want you to ask her out. And then I'll know if she says yes. I said, no problem. I'm in, all in. So I asked Gail out and she said yes. The rest is history, 41 years later. But God had reserved a very special person for Peter. And you just spoke so beautifully. Susanna, we're so glad that you came into our lives. But anyways, back, back when Peter got his car and license, I was dating Gail. She lived 30 minutes away from us. I, we lived in Braintree at the time. She lived in Pembroke. I conned Peter into, I did this. I said, Peter, hey, man, I'm hungry. I'd like some Coke and maybe some Hostess cupcakes, ring dings, you name it, Susie Q's, whatever you want. I'll go buy them if you'd let me take your car. Now, there was just a little convenience store right down the street. But I didn't, I go, I went past the convenience store from Braintree to through Weymouth, through all the way to Pembroke, and I ended up, voila, at Gail's house for the night. And then I came home late that night and said, sorry, Peter. And I'm sorry for that, Peter, but you know what, Peter? Peter would never got, could stay mad, could he? He just was always ready to forgive. He never held a grip. Paul tried to get him mad. Paul tries to get a lot of people mad, so you better watch out. But it just didn't work, did it? Uh, Peter, I'm sorry that Paul and I tormented you every time you wanted to take a nap, in the, a nap in the afternoon. We would be in the TV room. His room was just beyond that. And we would watch him because we knew it's nappy time for Peter. And he would go into his room, open the door, shut the door, and then we'd wait to just about thinking, okay, right about now, he's probably fading out. And then we would tiptoe up, crack that doorknob, and the door would go, and Peter would get so mad, he would start stomping, I can't believe you guys are doing this. Slam, shuts the door. And then he goes back, we wait just about when he's ready to fade out. And this cycle went on and on, didn't it? We tormented Peter. And I just want to apologize, Peter, for <laughs> all those ideas that Paul had. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, that I'm better looking than you. That's a joke. Sometimes Peter, we, oh, this tick, ticked us off, especially Paul, I think. Peter, are you the youngest? Are you, the yo are you the youngest, they would say to Peter. And that's because he dyed his hair brown and he never had any grays. But he swore that he didn't dye his hair. But I love to tell him that he's lying because it looked like he did. But the truth is he never dyed his hair. Uh, so he did look younger. And he, he knew how to weave that, bald, that eaten bald spot in a way to manipulate it, kind of like the Donald Trump thing, right? <laughs> Anyways, here, now I want to thank him. Peter, I want to thank you for being one of my favorite guys in the world to talk to. Your mind was so sharp, so in, informed. Thanks for the endless conversations about theology, politics, movie, and my very favorite is all of our family and friends' memories going way back. Thank you, Peter, for always being there for me and valuing our relationship. You know what, we never once, and this is how it should be with families, we never once in 61 years had a falling out. Not once did we have a falling out. We never grew distant except for miles, ever, because we were committed to our brotherhood. And if I can just encourage you, don't let, when that phone call came, when that phone call came, that my brother had died when I was in between services. 
I was so grateful that we didn't let anything separate us, even our parents' divorce. Don't let that happen to your families. Like Paul said in so many, get connected again. Forgive. Release things. What are we doing? Life is too short. Pretty soon, somebody that you love isn't going to be there. Thanks for laughing together about ridiculous things, Peter. Thanks for never believing in conspiracy theories. <laughs> well, at least, at least time proved that they weren't. Most of them. Peter was talking about things uh, decades ago, and my dad, that are actually happening right now in this world. <laughs> People you, you would just kind of scorn him and think, oh, that's a joke. They're happening now. Because he could see, and he was well-read, highly intelligent, and he knew what was going on. And I loved talking to him because he, he, just, he was just so insightful. I always admired you, Peter, that you were smarter than me. I never admitted that to you, but I can do it now that you're in heaven. <laughs> Thank you for bringing me peace with your worship songs in the early 70s, playing guitar while I slept on a cot in your room because of the anxiety I was having over mom and dad's divorce. I admired you for traveling all over the world without any money. At least you claim not to have any money. Susanna, I told you, you should go back in under the mattress and see where it all is, because he would be over here in L.A., then it'd be in Florida, then it'd be in Spain, then it'd be in Italy, and I'm like, how do you do this with no money? It's a secret that he wouldn't share. Oh, and one more thing, Peter, I want to thank you. And back to the, the, the stairwell all those years, 50-plus years ago. Remember that one that you almost died in front of us, but then it was just ice. It was about a month ago on a Sunday, and there was another stairwell that I spent about an hour in crying because I found out that my brother died after the 8.30 service I preached. I was greeting people when I was interrupted with a phone call, and it was my wife, got Gail, telling me that the AMTs were at their house, and Susanna said there's no pulse. And Adam and Caleb and myself and Mike Neary and Others, we were just praying so hard in that stairway, God, give Peter a pulse. Get his heart beating. Get his heart beating. This can't be true. In that stairwell, I contemplated for one hour my brother's life. Several minutes later, Paul called me and said he was gone. Adam asked me if I was going to preach the second message. So I decided to dedicate it to Peter. And that was a special Sunday because the Holy Spirit moved so powerfully in that place. We had parents all over Sacred Heart. They were praying a blessing over their children, which is a lost, it's, it's, a, it's a lost thing in the body of Christ. It, we've got to recover it. Because all through scriptures, we see parents blessing their children, being the agents of God's blessing. They would lay hands on their children and say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance before you and give you peace. So Aaron, the, the Israelite priest, was supposed to do that. But over and over, you see where parents would do that to their children. And there's so many unblessed people that have never got the blessing from somebody that should have given him a blessing. And so what happened in that moment is all over the room, blessings were flowing. The power of God was released. People were reconciling. And so because of Peter, it gave me more of an urgency, more of a passion to preach. And it was a beautiful time. So thank you, Peter, for that. Well, most of all, I want to thank Peter because he was the one in my impressionable years who, because I watched his life get so changed and transformed, it was him that I watched. You said it earlier, Paul. It was him that I observed. It was the transformation of his life that spoke to me. And I want to thank you, Peter, my big brother.
for the passion that you had for the brand new person you became in Jesus. Thank you, my big brother. You beat us all to heaven. No more lockdowns, mandates, or politicians grasping for totalitarian control. Did he just say that? Yes, I did, because that's exactly what Peter would say. Um, you are finally with King Jesus, the king who set you free from your sin and liberated you to love him and worship him, the king who came down the stairway to humanity and went to the cross for you and me because we could never ascend to him in our humanity, and that was a stairway that's far more important than any other stairway, is we try to ascend to be good to God, to earn some kind of righteousness that we never can. But what really happens is Jesus descended down the stairway to us, where he found us in our sin, our shame, and our sorrow, and our mess, and he came to love us, to forgive us, to die for us so that we could have life in him abundantly. And um, is my time up, Dominique? She's, she's shaking her head, yes. So I want you all to think of this one passage. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 says, it's Paul the Apostle. He's preaching in a hostile environment to the point where he's in jail <laughs> because he's preaching the gospel of Christ. I'll tell you right now, we live in a hostile environment. If you lived in China right now, you, as a Christian, you would not have any freedoms. They had to go underground, but they're some of the most powerful Christians you could ever see. And this same kind of stuff, uh, 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 same kind of ideas are, are trying to take root here in America. And Paul knew what it was like in that time that he lived, Paul the Apostle, because he was in jail for the gospel. But he said, you know what? You can chain me, but you can't chain the gospel. The gospel was going out because he was in jail even more. So um, he says, I eagerly, as he's in jail, he's, it's, by the way, Philippians is the rejoicing scripture. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. He had an eager expectation and hope, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. I wonder, do you have an eager expectation and hope that what, as you live and even when you die, that Christ will be magnified in your life as Paul did? Um, Paul's one purpose was to magnify Christ in his body. His imprisonment did not stop the gospel. Have you ever noticed with Peter, he wasn't ashamed. He'd say what he thinks. And I, for one, was led to the greatest life in Christ ever because of his unashamed, unabashed proclamation of Jesus Christ being Lord and Savior. Thank you, Peter, for that. He says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I want to ask you a question. Fill in the, bank, the blank. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If you were to fill in the blank, for me to live is what? Fill in the blank. What are you living for? For me to live is, what is that? What are you living for? And then the question is, when I, when I die, will there be a gain? Will I gain something? Or if I'm living for money, I'm going to lose it all anyways. If I'm living for popularity, <laughs> there's not going to be any popularity. Where, you, where are we going to go? What, what are we living for? Paul the Apostle, like Peter says, to live is Christ. <laughs> and then I know to die is gain. And he had an eager expectation that dying is not loss. It is gain. Can you imagine? So the first point I want to make to you is live for Jesus, especially in a hostile world. Don't hate the world. Don't curse the world. Bless the world. Shine the gospel. on. People are acting this way. When control freaks are control freaks because that's what they're living for that makes them feel important. Jesus was a great liberator of people. He lived to liberate. We need to live in the liberties of the gospel and love people on our way. Second is live wholeheartedly for Jesus because heaven is better by far. He says in verse 22, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? It's like, if I could choose, uh, um, he says, I do, I do not know, for I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. He's like, 
departing from this world and being with Christ, how many of you know, better by far? Do you think Peter would stand if he could come and say, he'd say, better by far, see ya, I'm going back. And he wouldn't come anyways. And you know, we're crying, but he's partying. He's in, he's in heaven seeing God Almighty on the throne, the Lamb of God shed his blood for our sins. The saints of God, mom and dad and Margaret <laughs> and, and all of my grandparents and Bobby and all of my uncles. And, and he's with them in their presence. And how much better. He's drinking coffee probably. I, I'm sure there's coffee. There, there needs to be coffee in heaven. Peter's post about my dad will all be re reunited someday. Ten days later, there he was. Number three, live for Jesus to serve others, strengthening their faith. Verse 24, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Do you live that way? Listen, it'd be great to go to heaven because that's amazing to die as gain. But it's necessary that we are here for others. Paul the Apostle had that mentality. He said, it's necessary for, for you that I remain in the body. Why? Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Are you live? Who are, who are we living for? If we're living to live as Christ means to live so that other people can strengthen their faith and grow in Jesus and that we can impart some value to others so they will fall in love with the same Jesus that we fell in love with. But if all we're doing is selfishly living for myself, then we're giving nothing away. And Jesus has given everything to us. He held nothing back. See that cross that my father built? You can't see it because it's... He gave everything. He died so that we could live. So he wants us to live so people, when they die, will live eternally. It's the same message. It never gets boring or tiresome for me. And then lastly, live for Jesus and be a sign for unbelievers. He says, what hap what, um, what, whatever happens, he says, whatever does happen with me, whether I li live or die, or I stay in this jail, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a worthy manner of the gospel of Christ. He's speaking to the whole church of Philippi. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm, listen, in one spirit. Division is of the devil. It's satanic. Dividing against canceling people. That's right straight from hell. Over politics? So stupid. Sorry for being so raw. I can do that. It's my brother's service. Stop this foolishness, cutting off relationships because of some stupid political view. God, help us. He says, I will know that you stand in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. Real quick, how can we be a sign? Everybody say sign. He wants us to be a sign to others to point them to Jesus. Number one, be an example. It's so important. Conduct ourselves in a worthy manner of the gospel. How we live, how we speak, how we act, how we behave. It either will compel people toward Jesus or repel them away. And Paul's saying, conduct yourself in a worthy manner. My brother Peter loved non-believers. They never felt judged by him. They only felt like connected by him. I love that about Peter. He would connect with anyone and make them feel like he's part of their lives. Be an example. Number two, be unified with other believers, striving for the gospel. My brother was big on unity. He grieved over broken relationships and always fostered connection. And lastly, how do we be a sign? We can be a sign by being fearless in opposition. Be fearless. Be courageous. The world thinks that we're the bad ones. But what they need to see is Christ in us, full of love, full of grace, full of truth, holding nothing back. The world needs right now to be loved. They need the truth, too. But they need the truth to come packaged in people who love them. If you let 
politics separate you from a person that needs Jesus, we're going to answer that to Jesus. It never should. Peter, I love you with my whole heart. And I hope all of us can look at his life and say, I want to have what he has. Okay, we have a surprise for you. And when Peter came to faith, he bought an album. It was called Love Song. And this guy, Chuck Gerard, started a band back in the 70s that became known all over the place. They traveled everywhere. They were hippies, doing drugs, living, living in um, uh, yeah, Southern California, but when they live together, it's a com <laughs> commune. It's, it's a 61-year-old brain not working good, okay? Easy. Um, so living in a commune, they heard about this guy, Chuck Smith, preaching the gospel. All these hippies on the beaches were going to his church in their muscle T-shirts, no shoes on their feet, getting saved. Chuck Gerard was one of them. His music completely changed my life and mostly Peter's life. Peter wrote to Chuck all these years later, finding out that he wrote a book about his life. He says, I can do a movie for you. Chuck took him up on it. For five years, they wrote the script. Peter wrote the script for his movie that I believe will be upcoming. And Chuck, Chuck Gerard is right here with us. So um, Chuck's going to sing a couple of his songs. So we're going to welcome you, Chuck. Thank you for coming. Back when I was a kid, which was quite a long time ago, uh, my sister brought home doo-wop records, uh, Still of the Night by the Five Satins and Johnny and Joe Over the Mountain. And I love that music. And then I heard Elvis Presley. And I thought, man, I want to do that. I can't be him, but I want to do something like that. And such an impact that music was on my life. And what an honor it is for me so many years later to have my albums have that same kind of an impact on the life of so many young Christians back in the 70s. Our album was considered sort of the Sgt. Pepper of Christian music and uh, such an impact. We, were, we weren't together very long, but uh, the music was very influential to in the lives of young believers who could see the model of how you could use modern music to communicate the gospel. We're just a bunch of hippies in the right place at the right time. There was no plan. It was just what we did, and uh, God really used it. Um, I got a, I never do Facebook, <laughs> hardly ever. I mean, I, I look at it almost every day, but I never respond to anything. I just, I, I think it's a good, because of the kind of friends I have on my uh, site, it's a good indicator of where people are at in the world. So I like to see people's comments and all that, but it's not a place for dialogue for me. So I never look at messages, but one day I did. And there was this message on there said, my name is Peter Eaton. I'm a Christian director. I love your music, and I'd like to do something with your, you know, with you sometime. So I had just uh, finished writing the rough uh, edition of my book. It was rough, the rough edit. And I said, well, I, you know, my book's kind of rough, but check it out. See what you think about my bio. So he, I think he read it in two days. Got back to me. He said, man, can I, he always asked me for things that would be obvious. You know, can I can I uh, see if I could get a movie made of this? Yeah, <laughs> why not? <laughs> no, I don't think so, Peter. Uh, yeah, so uh, for we, yeah, we wrote this. Well, that was uh, the script part was an interesting thing. He says, I got this guy that I think will write the script for us, and that didn't pan out. Nobody panned out. So finally we just said, why don't we write it? So it took about five years, and we wrote, oh, so many drafts. Of the, you know, we'd go over it, and we'd go, oh, let's change this. Then we'd talk to somebody, and in the business, and they'd say, well, you got to have this in the script, and we'd say, well, you know, uh, let's change that a little bit. Finally got it kind of to a place where we liked it, and um, he, he just kept going. He just kept, he never stopped trying to get that movie made, and uh, we're not going to stop now either. We're going to continue to try to figure out what to do from here, what God has for us. But uh, Neil was telling me that uh, this is one of the songs that, uh, that, that they, they really liked. We didn't have charts in those days. This was 1970. CCM mu uh, Music Magazine didn't come out till mid-70, something or in there. So the only way that you knew that you had a hit song was people would request it. You know, you go to play and people say, play this, play that. 
Uh, so this was it would probably be a hit if uh, can I can I get to, yeah let me this is okay I'm gonna move this back a little bit um, this would probably be a hit if we had such things in those days it's called Little Country Church and it was about what was happening at Calvary Chapel back in those days uh, when all the hippies were getting saved one, uh, a couple of my, one of my favorite stories was the Chuck Smith came in one one time uh, for a service and all the hippies were in the lobby. And uh, Chuck said, "Well, all, why, why, are, why aren't you letting them in? Why aren't you having them be seated?" You know. And they said, "Well, Chuck, they all have bare feet, and we just got new carpet. And you know, they're going to come in and they're going to track dirt in on the carpet." And Chuck said, "Well, let's just take the carpet out then." And uh, had them come in, and you know, they just stick their toe through the through the communion cup. You know, <laughs> there's actually a picture of somebody doing that. It's just really informal. Bunch of hippies going to church with straight people too, and what a what an awesome time it was. So I wrote this song about it called Little Country Church, and uh, we'll do this one, and then I have another one planned, and uh, just celebrate uh, Peter's life. I didn't get to know him as much as some people in this room did, but what a wonderful guy. It didn't take very long to get to know him and know that you loved him. So here we go. I don't know how loud this will be, so we'll check it out. I think it goes twice. No, it goes once. Sorry, I don't do this too often. Man in a box. And it's very plain to see It's not the way it used to be Preacher isn't talking about religion no more He just wants to praise the Lord People aren't as stuffy as they were before They just want to praise the Lord And it's very plain to see it's not the way it used to be. No, no, no. Come on, rock beat. Rock and roll here. They're talking about revival and the need for love That little church has come alive Working with each other for the common good Putting all the past aside Long hair, no hair, some coats and ties People finally coming around Looking past the hair and straight into the And it's very plain to see It's not the way it used to be No, no, no Well, it's a little early, and I am a lot older, so a little grace there.
to the presence of the King. Come behind the veil and walk with me in the cool of the day. I'll walk with you for where I am is paradise. Look into my eyes, look into my eyes, how I long for you as you long for me. Won't you take the time to visit for a while? For your precious presence brings joy to my heart. Oh, now, my child, come on through and enter. to the throne room of the Father. Enter in to the presence of the King. Come behind the veil and be my love in the secret place. I wait for you. Be one with me, for I'm in you, you're in me, we are one. When you dwell with me, and I dwell with you, all the pain in life will surely have to flee. For between the wings of the cherubim is that place of peace, that place of rest, right here with me. So enter in to the throne room. Let's all sing together just one verse of this uh, real simple chorus. Alleluia. Here, let's let's bring it down to a different key here. Alleluia. 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 Hallelujah. 
Amen. Praise the Lord. Bye for now, Peter. I just wanted to close with a benediction, which is a blessing um, that I can bestow or any believer can bestow on behalf of God. I can't bless people, but I can be God's vessel to communicate that. And I want to say sincerely from my heart that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, I, I love you. If you're a conservative or liberal, I sincerely love you. If you're a anti-masker or a pro-masker, I love you. If you're anti-vaccine or pro-vaccine, I love you. I sincerely do. And forgive any, if you're a seeker and haven't come to faith in Christ, forgive any one of us believers who may have offended or hurt you. Jesus is working on us. It's no excuse. But I sincerely want to bestow this blessing to you. And it's from Numbers chapter 6. And it goes like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. That means protect you, to build a hedge around you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. That simply means that God looks at you with grace. And he's looking at you to shine his favor upon you. Lord, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. That means a continual flow of God's goodness in your life. The Lord lift up his countenance to you, meaning he's looking at you specifically. You're not just one of a number, but he might lift his countenance before you and give you peace because the greatest peace that you can have in your life is peace with God. Jesus died so that you could have peace with God simply by trusting in the provision God made, that radical price he paid, his one and only son, to die on a cross. So all our sins can be forgiven because Jesus was already penalized and judged for our sin at the cross. He took all the judgment so that you don't have to. God is just say, saying, have faith the gift I've given you, would you put your faith in me because nothing else is going to matter when it's all said and done and you breathe your last. Nothing else matters. He's offering this beautiful salvation gift to everyone whosoever will believe. And I hope that you would say, yes, Jesus, you laid down your life for me. I'll give it all up. And I'll surrender my life to live for you so that I can please you. I can bring you glory. I can have the power from on high to say no to sin and live for you. We'll never live perfectly this side of heaven. I didn't. Peter definitely didn't. Paul definitely. definitely. No, I'm just kidding, Paul. <laughs> None of us. We all fail. I don't care if some is more outward than others. We're all sinners. I'm no better than you. Not one bit better. We're all desperate sinners in need for a Savior. I love you. Um, and downstairs, we can party. I think we'll set up a little mic if somebody wants to share, because there's a ton of you that could tell a lot of stories. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Sing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My 
my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me blind but now 